getting here through this weather and um, congratulations for, for making it through um, this dampness. Yes, it is a, um, a, a real pleasure to have uh, Benedict with us. Benedict and Chantel. Um, you can stand up, Chantel. Turn around so they can see you. us. Um, Benedict um, did his theological training in Germany and has finished, but they are currently visiting um, Chantel's parents here on the Sunshine Coast. So um, he's keen to do some preaching. So we were, we were happy to oblige, and it's lovely to have you here with us today. So thank you for coming, and we look forward to hearing from you. Our call to worship today um, comes from Psalm 67, which is the psalm that's set for today, and it's a responsive reading, and I invite you to read the parts that are in what colour? In white, yes. So let's read this psalm together. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Let your ways be known upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. peoples praise you, O God. The earth has brought forth her increase. May God give us his blessing, and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe of him. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our first hymn of praise to God, God of mercy, God of grace. psalmist could only dream about. You've not only blessed our lives with Jesus, but you continue to pour your blessings upon us and within us through the person of the Holy Spirit. This gracious gift of your Spirit continues to teach us about Jesus and to remind us of all he said and did. Today we rejoice too over his gift of us, to us of peace, his peace. Peace that he says it's beyond our human understanding. And we receive this gift with thanksgiving and pray that our lives may reflect this peace and your love. May this time of worship be an offering of praise and adoration for all your gifts to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's bring to God our prayers of confession. Lord Jesus Christ, you encourage the disciples and us with the promise of the Holy Spirit, sent by God in your name. You also promise the wonderful gift of your peace. Forgive us when we hold on to our insecurities and fears rather than take hold of your gift of peace. Forgive us when we forget your promises to us and when we seek our identity in other than you and your teachings. Forgive us, Lord. Jesus, Saviour and Lord, through the gift of your Spirit, you give us the means to serve as you served, to love as you loved, to live as you lived. When our insistence on doing our own thing stifles the promptings of your Spirit, forgive us, Lord. Lord of every part of our lives, help us to let go of all that hinders our acceptance of your peace, your love, and your very life through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. This we pray in your name. Amen. Hear the words of pardon, uh, the words that come to us from John's Gospel, chapter 3. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. The good news, therefore, is this. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and we receive his peace. Thanks be to God. Indeed, thanks be to God. Now, Grace and Emma are going to read the scripture for us. Thanks, girls. During the night, Paul had a vision. 
vision. Then stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called, had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We therefore set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Nepolius, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and the Roman colony. We remained in the city for some days. On the seventh day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there would have been some prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women who have gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshipper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thabatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come stay in my heart, and she prevailed upon us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. I invite Benedict to come and talk now to the children. You girls might like to stay there with mum and dad. Hey, do you want to do that? Benedict can talk to you from there. Is that all right? And then you can all hear him as well. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, children. Now, my name is Benedict. My last name is Exner. Benedict Exner. Your names are Grace and Emma, correct? Yeah. Names are funny, aren't they? Like, they sometimes have a funny sound, and sometimes they're, they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. Did you know that names have meanings? Did you guys know that? No. Yeah, they sometimes can have meanings, sometimes a name can mean something, and sometimes they can even tell us secrets. My name, for example, Benedict, <coughs> it actually means Blessed it comes from Latin. Bene means good, and Benedict means blessed. Um, that's why we sometimes call at the end of the uh, at the end of the service we call when we bless the church or when the preacher passes the church. That's called the benediction. So that's what my name means. Maybe you can ask your parents after the service if they know what your names mean. Um, yeah, but sometimes names can even tell us secrets. Um, can I have the slide? That one. So, my last name is Exner. Do you have any idea what that could have to do with this picture? Yeah? Maybe it's a cow? Does it mean a cow? Like my last name? Could something have to, have something to do with a cow? Yeah, these are oxen, actually. So, you were pretty good with, with being a type of cow. Yeah, that's right. So, my last name actually tells us that my great, 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 great grandfather, a long time ago, he worked with oxen, so he was an oxner. And that's where my name comes from. Exner came out of the name oxner. So sometimes names can have meanings and they can sometimes even tell us secrets about the past. But what's most important to remember is that God knows us all by name. He knows you guys by name. Um, but not only that, he knows more than our names. He knows that we are his beloved children. He knows that, um, yeah, that we are his people. And um, that's the most important thing to remember. That we're not just names to God. We're more than names to God. That's all I wanted to tell you guys. Should we sing a song, I believe? And then you guys can go to the shimmer and have to Thank you. Let's all stand as we're able and sing our song, God Sends Us His Spirit. Thanks. Jesus, we thank you for the children. Thank you for 
looking after them and for knowing them so well. Thank you that you're with them and that you look after them and that you know them better than they even know themselves. We thank you that we can, as your children, all of us, trust you in everything that we do, trust you in our entire life. And I pray for yeah, the children as they go to Christian learning now, that you bless them and that you are with them and that you teach them and um, that you show them how wonderful you are. In your name. Amen. Right. Love you, good. Christian learning. Names are pretty interesting, aren't they? They carry meaning, they can tell us about a person's history. For example, if you used to be called by a different last name, we could probably deduct that you got married at some point in the past. Or if your name can only be spelled correctly by using letters that are not in the English alphabet, then your family might have ties to a country or culture outside of this one. Or maybe you have a name that sounds a bit funny, and we could guess you might have had a difficult time while, with your name while you were in Mexico. But names can sometimes tell us secrets, as we have heard in the children's address already. And when it comes to reading and interpreting the Bible, the names of people and places, um, they can provide us with quite a lot of information that the Bible story itself doesn't, doesn't give us directly. And Lydia, the woman from the story, she has a name like that. The passage that we just heard from Acts 16 provides us already some, some information about this woman. Paul and his fellow travelers meet her outside of the city gate of Philippi by the river. We know that she originally was from a city called Tyatira, and that she was a dealer in purple cloth. This purple dyed fabric would have been quite a rare and expensive commodity, which tells us that Lydia must have had quite a little bit of money at her disposal. She would have been somewhat wealthy in order to trade with this material. We also know that she was already a worshipper of God even before Paul started talking to her. That means she wasn't herself Jewish, but she must have heard about the God of the Jews before and decided to worship him some time ago. People in Philippi would have, had, would have worshipped many different Greek, Roman, Macedonian gods and goddesses, yet Lydia followed the faith of a minority. We know of one or two other examples in the New Testament of Gentiles like her who decided to worship the God of Israel, but it would not have been very common. From, from what we read in the text, we understand she was in charge of her own household, which would have included servants and slaves and possibly her children. That is also fairly uncommon, since it was the norm um, for a man in this culture to be the master of the house, and everyone in the household, including his wife, would have submitted under him and his decisions. But no, in reading these few short verses, Lydia seems to have been a wealthy and professional woman who already worshipped the God of Israel even before Paul and Silas approached her. See, she's portrayed as a remarkably independent woman for her time. But I want to come back to her name for a moment. Because while this passage already gives us some idea of who Lydia was, the name Lydia contains even more information. Lydia was probably not only the name, not the only name this woman had, she probably had a different one. In what is now Turkey, there used to be a province that was called Lydia, that was originally its own kingdom. And the city of Tyatira, that the Bible passage mentions as where this woman comes from, is actually in that region of Lydia. In other words, Lydia was probably not the name her parents gave her, it was more of a nickname. She was the woman from Lydia, or the Lydian. 
And that is something that people do still today, to refer to people by where they come from. But it's not exactly the nicest way of referring to someone, is it? To not bother with learning their actual names, and instead calling them, I don't know, the German or the Italian. It's not exactly kind or respectful. In ancient times, this sort of behavior was very common when it came to slaves. When a master bought a slave, the name of the slave did not really matter. The master could change the name if they chose to, and could call them whatever they wanted. And if a slave came from, I don't know, this region or that region, it was convenient to call them by that region. Because of this, some scholars have speculated that this woman called Lydia in Acts might have actually been a former slave from the region of Lydia. If that is true, then she either managed to buy her own freedom, or was freed by someone else in her past, and the name Lydia stuck with her, even after she was freed. What a journey this woman would have been on. Perhaps she was born into slavery, perhaps sold into it at a later point in her life. She might have been a slave when she came to the city of Philippi. Maybe she married a man who helped her out of slavery. Maybe she came, uh, maybe she made it all on her own. Maybe she found a group, um, sorry. maybe she found a group of people who worshipped the God of Israel, and maybe they were the ones who bought her freedom for her and enabled her to establish her own successful business. After all, it seems unlikely that she was able to accomplish all of this all on her own and without the generosity of others. Even today, most success stories include a lot of supportive people in the background. Maybe that is why she was so eager to support the mission Paul and Silas were on once she had become a Christian. Maybe the generosity she had experienced in her past had enabled her to now be supportive and generous herself. We don't know. Whatever her story was exactly, she must have already had quite an interesting life before Paul approached her by that river. She was an accomplished woman that must have been respected enough to run a successful trading business. Not only that, but she had also found that the multitude of religious options available to her, the many, many gods and goddesses she could have worshipped in Philippi, were inferior to the God of Israel. She would have been a person that made her own decisions, had responsibility over others, over her household, must have been strong and confident enough to deal with her business partners and the competition. Most of that competition would have been men, and some of which, some of these men would have definitely looked down on her for being a woman in the business world. And when the news about Jesus came to her, she listened carefully, made the decision to follow him, and got baptized with her house. And she supported Paul, Silas, and the mission by moving her house to them. It is quite possible that her house became the first Christian church in Philippi. After all, this was the place Paul and Silas went back to to say their fellow, fellow to say their farewells to the Christians there before they left Philippi for good. There are a lot of names and stories in the Bible that are fairly easy to glance over. For many of us, Lydia might be one of them. She's only mentioned in this chapter and never comes up again anywhere else in Acts or in Paul's letters. Or so it seems at least. Paul later writes a letter to the church in Philippi, we know it as Philippians, um, and in said letter he does mention two women by name. He calls neither of them Lydia, but maybe one of them is still her. Since Lydia was more of a nickname, it is possible that she decided to let go of it after a while and wanted to be called by another name. Or maybe Paul mentions her indirectly. She might have been one of the deacons or bishops he addresses at the beginning of his letter. Or maybe her business has taken her elsewhere and she's no longer part of the church of Philippi. As you can see, there are many things that we simply do not know about this woman. We don't know exactly where she came from, and we don't know where she went. What we do know, though, is that, based on the witness in the Book of Acts, 
Lydia is the very first person in Philippi that became a Christian. And that makes this woman, according to our modern understanding of geography and of the world, and as far as we know, the first person in all of Europe to become a Christian. In a way, one could say that the long journey that the Christian faith took to slowly spread through Europe and then later from Europe to so many other parts of the world, including Australia, in a way, this long, winded and complicated journey started here with this conversation Paul and Silas had by the river outside the city gate of Philippi with this woman called Lydia. Many people over the last 2,000 years admired this woman so much they wanted to get baptized at the exact spot where she was baptized. To this day, there exists a small baptistry outside of Philippi that, according to local tradition, was built at the exact spot where Lydia was baptized. And, to this day, this woman, that we only know by a name that might not even be her real one, is remembered by the Greek Orthodox Church as a saint. And her day of remembrance actually happened to have been on May 20th, which was only two days ago. Lydia might have had a difficult past, and her name might have been one that is easy, might be one that is easy to glance over when we read the Bible. She was a woman who stood up for herself, who decided to seek God in her life, and when she found him in Jesus Christ, she made history. At the beginning of this passage, Paul has a vision that tells him to take his fellow travelers to Macedonia. Now, this is something that happens to Paul regularly. The Holy Spirit tells him to go here and there, and then he plants one church after another. In Acts, there are only 28 verses that record that time in Philippi, so it's not a very long time. We don't know exactly how many days that would be. And then Paul and Silas and the rest of the gang well, they leave, and they go back on the road, and they go to the next city, and the one after that. And while Paul's life and ministry are certainly very impressive, and we can most definitely learn a lot from Paul and the way he followed God and searched for his ways, I think Paul's experience of the Christian life is fairly unique. And if I'm honest, his life is not always all that relatable. Normal people, like Lydia, a little bit more related to me. And I believe it is right and good for us to remember this woman and to take her as an example. She was a person with struggles and responsibilities. She was more than the name possibly given to her as a slave. She was a follower of Jesus. And you, here this morning, you are also more than your name and more than your difficult past. And just like Jesus found a way to call Lydia to himself and to follow him, Jesus found a way to call you to follow him. There are a lot of maybes in Lydia's life, a lot of question marks about who she was, where she came from, and where she went. But we know that she was accepted and beloved by the God she found in Jesus Christ who is the same God we worship and follow here today. There are many names we read about in the New Testament that we sometimes glance over, but all of them have their own unique stories behind them. Stories that were lived by real people like us today, who had their own struggles and their own triumphs, and who at some point in their life found themselves confronted with the light and love of Jesus Christ. And while our lives may sometimes feel insignificant or easy to glance over, God sees us. He sees the struggle we face in our daily life, doing our work, taking care of the people we are responsible for. And He allows us, ordinary people, to be part of the many stories that He is writing with the people of this world. God sees you, and He includes you. You are so much more than just a name to Him, and He wants to write His story with you. Amen.
Let's respond to that challenge to allow ourselves to be called and to follow as we, I invite you to stand as we sing the next hymn together. I the Lord of sea and sky, let's stand as you're able. that we know are mourning 
the loss of loved ones, who are mourning the loss of health and lifestyle. We pray for those that are suffering illness and we pray for healing for them. We pray for each other and we pray for those that are lonely and vulnerable. And we pray for ourselves. For not one of us has ever found or given enough tenderness or love in our life. We're always travelling to a new tomorrow to find new ways of being true to your calling for all that you call us to be, for all that you purpose for us. And so we pray that you'll enable us by your spirit to be true to our calling. We pray for our world, we pray for others, and we pray for ourselves. And we pray because you have put within us the promises that give us hope and purpose. We pray because Jesus is our Lord and your kingdom is in our midst. Amen. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in a time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I invite you to sing together with me as we sing. Community of Christ, live out your creed, risk your life for God alone. Let's stand and sing together. We go into this week renewed in who we are. Know your name. Know what God has called you to be. Know that you wear Christ's name and all that is in him. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. Let's sing that blessing on each other.